<laughs> to just keep us st- taped in. Uh, awesome. So it's showing up on Twitch. Mm-hmm. Is there another tweet that I should tweet? Yeah. Good. And then Facebook. There we are. Right Facebook. Here. Let me get the chat going. And the comments will just show up. Yeah. Comments will uh, click on comments. And then yes. Okay. Comments will just show up. And then there. Oh, hey, everybody. We already got people. There we go. Yeah, we're good to go. Kidding. This guy? Yeah. He's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are good. Are the people in the chat? Yeah, we got we got Lucos, Patrick, Bryson, Base of the. Okay. Suspense in that name. Are you gonna? You don't know. Are you gonna read every name? You think you should? Well, Nimhoff. Oh, there we go. Sure. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we are. Twenty-four viewers. Okay. Awesome. Welcome everybody to the Oath uh, Q and A with Cole. Um, my name is Gates. I am actually the marketing director over here at Leader. And then Cole, what do you do? There? I design games, mostly. Yeah, like Root. Mm-hmm. Just a small, tiny one. And then also is the designer for Oath. Um, we're just going to answer some questions today. We're going to wait for kind of people to drop into the chat, and stuff like that. Other than that, how does it feel to be five days out from a Kickstarter? It feels good. Busy. <laughs> Feels busy. There's always like no matter how much we plan ahead, things always kind of coalesce yeah. right at the end. So yeah. I feel um, like half my time right now is Kickstarter prep, and the other half is development. Yeah. She's been working on the tabletop simulator, which we'll talk about. Mm-hmm. Like that. I have my advent calendar, as Patrick puts it, on my wall that I've been ripping off, and I've slowly started getting into the the delirious time. Oh yeah. Because <laughs> I I walked in today being like it's six days, but no, it's actually five. So. It's going to be pretty good. Um, are we good, Nick? Yeah, everything still seems good. Okay, great. Nobody's cool. We're still online, and nobody's saying anything about the quality yet. So that's excellent. There we go. Those are the only two things you can ask for, really. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we can just kick it off with it. the big major questions. Uh, for those who don't know, Oath is coming to Kickstarter next Tuesday, January fourteenth. Um, it will be that mor- that morning. Mm-hmm. Um. As it stands right now, we're still getting a couple more quotes to pin down the price. Mm-hmm. So the best thing I, we can tell you is that the price will definitely be on at launch. Right. Um, we'll be there. We can guarantee that part. Um, as far as the details of the game, I know that we've kind of seen, changed some details very recently mm-hmm. as far as player count, if you want to go into yeah, that. Yeah, so uh, we originally had positioned the game as a one to five player game. It now looks like it will scale to six. And that it was able, we were able to do that sort of inexpensively. And so, mm-hmm. Oath is a one to six player game. It has a bot that is used for the one and two player, uh, and then the rest of the uh, player counts you don't necessarily need to have the bot uh, for. Um, yeah, I don't know how deeply do you want me to go. The overview. Even yeah, no, even go into like the overview of the game. All right, just cool. A bit. So, so Oath is a political game. It's um, a really. So it's, it's, it's a very, it's, it's a, let me think about the best way to position this. So Oath is bigger than our usual games. Um, the box is larger, there's more stuff in the game, and it's a giant, almost sandboxy, large strategy game where the game remembers how you play it and then adapts to the way that you're playing it. So that you could make a decision in one game and it could have reverberations for dozens of games afterward. Uh, there are no prescripted narratives, there are no kind of apps or anything associated with it. You can keep playing it forever, you'll never destroy a card or anything, and you're always free to reset the box back to its kind of factory default if you want to. Yeah. I think also a big thing that we actually haven't shown that mm-hmm. is over in the, uh, the, the hot box, the hot box. box right over there, is uh, the Chancellor Maple. Oh, this is scary because I can't see Oh, yeah, no, you were, we're watching that. Oh, <laughs> we're this watching. is good. <laughs> well, maybe you guys want to point to the left. So you're yeah. the... There we go. Yeah. I'm just showing. He's lifting off. Yeah. So we have the Chancellor. <laughs> Chancellor Maple hasn't, hasn't been seen. And then we also have the black character mm-hmm. and then some war bands. And those are the things that came the in on Tuesday. So we'll have them chill out over there together. 
There you go. Look at that. Uh, yeah, there's the the uh, the black player pawn, and then I'll show you guys some war bands. Uh, so here's a, the red war band, and then show you the purple one. And then one thing I'll note about this: our color palette is very colorblind friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, but just to go a little extra mile, we also have unique screen printing on the banners on the war bands, so you can tell them apart that way. And I brought in a cute little woodland. Alliance. Oh yeah, for scale. Here's for a little, scale. Here's a little with an alliance little friend. There's a war band. You'll see the war band's like a little wider, just about as tall. And then uh, for scale against a pawn, uh, we'll put a player pawn. Right there. These are big chunky players. Yeah. So how much, um, I know that we've talked about it, but how much wood is going to be, or like the meals? A lot, like, <laughs> like twice as much as in root core. There's about 70 to 80 pieces that are screen printed mm -hmm. plus some additional wood. Yeah. Uh, it's a ton. There's a, a ton of wood in the box. Yeah. So all of the screen printed meals I think that you enjoyed in root, there's, you'll, you'll get your fix. Yes. <laughs> um, Awesome. So I'm going to be going over some questions that we kind of pre-took before the stream. But if you guys have questions in the chat, we have Nick in here. We also have Patrick, who's also in the chat, too. And we will definitely um, ship them or put them in there, too. So first being is I know that we've talked about uh, a tabletop simulator mod. Mm -hmm. um, where is that at right now? So there are, you, you may see uh, screenshots and reviews and, and things that I post from a tabletop simulator mod. Um, we have an excellent mod that is being built right now uh, by Train Brain Games. Uh, the Tabletop Simulator mod is complete. It works. It plays. But right now, it's, we're using it for development only and for people who are doing reviewers, uh, review copies. Um, we may release it wider during the Kickstarter. We're not really sure yet. But for those testing uh, the game, they are using it. There will be a TTS mod later. Yeah. Um, which is going to be hopefully pretty tricked out and have lots of you know useful scripts and a lot of uh, features built in. Yeah, absolutely. What about a print and play too? Um, we uh, may do one of those as well. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I know it, that that's been. Yeah, <laughs> it is. This is a um, root. It was a hard print and play. Mm -hmm. Vast TMM was a hard print and play. There are just a lot of pieces. Yeah. Uh, this game has so much more. <laughs> Yeah, I was about um, to say, for a print and play, like, if you wanted to go get it nicely done, it's probably going to equal the same cost mm -hmm. as the game of you backing it. Yeah, and for <laughs> for out. Root, what, one of the things about the print and play that we could do is we took that print and play that we released through, I think, three different uh, releases over the course of the campaign. Uh, that basically, you needed full updates each time. And then if you wanted to keep your kit somewhat current, you could usually get away by um, by just printing certain sheets. Um, the way this game is structured, it, it'd be just a little bit more difficult to do version control. So mm -hmm. currently, we're not going to be doing any print and plays during the campaign. We may release one later. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the big thing with the, the TTS, the reason why we haven't been opening it up is just for containment right now. Yeah. And so we're, we're seeing if we can get to that point during the Kickstarter, mm -hmm. and if not, it's definitely going to be yeah. really Yeah, it is, it, is, it is done and stable. It, the, mo the biggest thing I don't want to have happen is if we give folks the file and it gets passed around. I don't want somebody to have an old version bothering people with slightly different versions, and then everyone's wasting their time because if they would have wait, waited like a month or two, yeah. they'd be in a position of greater stability. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the one question that was in the chat here is, who else from Leader is on the project? I also didn't mention that Kyle Farron, uh, of course, is doing the art for the game, but mm -hmm. everybody in the studio works on the, works on the game. Yeah. Um, so we currently actually, Patty Hoon is working on the graphic design right now. We have Marshall with shipping and logistics, and we have Clay um, with all the sales and everything like that, too. So everybody in the studio, mm -hmm. um, we can go down the, the whole list. So. Yeah, and... You know, this is a little bit of a different, like the way we operate uh, in the studio is a little different from a normal game company. In a normal game company, you'll kind of assemble teams and you rely a lot on contractors. Yeah. Uh, for us, with rare exception, most of it, most everyone is employed full time uh, and everyone helps work on the game. So I've been doing most of the development and, de and design to this point. Kyle's been doing most of the art. Mm -hmm. We've together been doing a lot of the art direction, world building around the game. Um, and then... Everyone has been helping playtest, yeah. and in, in the way that that also leads to development, everyone's kind of been helping a little bit on development. And then uh, the one person who isn't on staff, uh, Josh Yearsley, who's the editor of Root, is returning as the editor for this project. Um, yeah, and then we have the usual team, you know, Carol's yeah. doing customer service. Yes. I'm trying to think of anybody else to, uh, 
Ted, Ted is he's our accounting accountant. Yeah, is he, every, he get does, everybody. Yeah, I think that is everybody. It's just like going. It's going around the office. Right. It's going Patrick's around the, the owner. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so uh, and that kind of is a good segue to an earlier question somebody had asked, um, being like, "What was the influence that you took outside of the game that kind of helped?" So, example that you've had the idea for how the player pieces would look before handing it off to Kyle. So, mm -hmm. like, how does that relationship work between you and Kyle? Because I personally think it's unique. Yeah. So we. Um, Kyle and I talk a lot about yeah. about the products we're working on, and we um, for Oath is a lot of ideas that I think we talked about when we were talking about Root. I mean, especially with, like this the way Root's pieces are stylized. Mm -hmm. um, I know I don't want to speak out of turn for Kyle, but I feel like both of us wanted a presentation that like built on that style as mm -hmm. opposed to using plastic minis or using chips or different things or using. Um, a more uh, realistic silhouette for, for the yeah. war bands. And so, you know, I'm, I'll be working on a design and in the early stages of a design, I will send Kyle messages like, okay, I think this is the shape this design might take. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, like, one, do you, do you see this adapting to any questions that you're working on? Because the way I think, both of us understand that we have like a big list of like questions about our craft that we're interested in. Mm -hmm. And then we wanna make sure that whatever we're working on is resonating with the other person's list. Yeah. Um, and so, like for the warband design, so the, these these meeples, um, there's not one not, not one displayed right now. I'll put one. I'll put one up while I talk about the warband meeples. Um, so the game can cover a lot of different things, and so it was important from a pretty early stage to find a warband shape, term, general physical presence that could just be a lot of things. It could be you know mounted. Archers, it could be like a big hulking scary guy. It could be a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So we have to find a shape that is able to communicate uh, that space. And, mm -hmm. you know, I offer very bad sketches sometimes, but mostly Kyle uh, <laughs> can sort of take the word salads I give him and then turn it into something that, that yeah. makes sense. And we try also, I think, to give each other like a lot of space to play. So when we were talking about uh, this game is really complicated uh, demands on the, the visual information. There's yeah. like a lot on the table. And so early on, you know, I, I told that, you know, Kyle, this is an important part of this design is that there are all these like information layers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Kyle said, oh, well, this is great because I kind of want to do a map in this style, but the cards in this different style, and then trying to find a middle point. Mm -hmm. And so I, I never feel like I, I dictate to Kyle, or I, at least I try not to dictate to Kyle specific instructions about how I want art to look. Yeah. He knows a lot more about it than I do. Instead, I just try to have him understand what the design is going to be doing. Um, and so a, a, a couple of sort of quick examples on that. One of them is when we were building the game, we wanted to make a fantasy game, um, but we really wanted to avoid a lot of the traditional tropes of fantasy gaming. Yeah. The biggest one is like, uh, racialized depictions of the different peoples, yeah. right? Kind of like, oh, if you're skinny and you have long hair, you're an elf. Yeah. And then it also kind of having this like sort of weird background to like what those racialized um, races, I mean, it's their, mm -hmm. their archetypes, how they kind of map on, uh, very unkindly onto histories of racism. So we're like, okay, we want a fantasy setting where we don't, where, where we get around don't that. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, do, we just want to be really conscious about what we're working in. So when we were setting up the different suits of the game, the game has six suits. And um, so I, you know, we've been talking a lot about like depictions of race and fantasy. And then Kyle had the suggestion like, oh, well, like what if you build the suits instead of around like nations, what if they're built around like ideas? And mm -hmm. he, I think Kyle called them like cultural aspects. Yeah. And so he gave me a big list of different cultural aspects. And then I went through it and like edited a couple, to a couple when we got to six. Um, and then those, that was the seed of the game's six suits. Mm -hmm. So like from the conversation about like art and philosophy and the sort of general conversations around craft, it sort of draws a line eventually to like the actual game, game. and then the yeah. elements of the game. So mostly it's a lot of us chatting back and forth yeah. about this stuff. And I think it's important to know that Kyle is on staff with us. Yes, he is. Um, Cause I think traditionally in the gaming world, like we've you know, seen a lot of our friends um, that do other games and they'll go to another publisher and everything like that. But Kyle's actually on staff with us. So he's very mm -hmm. involved in the world building and, and the lore aspect mm -hmm. along with you guys in your yep. conversation, which Kyle will also have a live stream with us during the Kickstarter where he'll be talking more about the art and the world mm -hmm. that he formed too. Um, just to kind of cover a couple of questions that are coming up a little bit in the uh, stream is as far as 
the pledge goals and what they're going to be expecting is, I think it's fair to say that we can say that there will be a pledge level. Um, we are going to be offering uh, the will be stuff that is included. You are going, the benefit to backing the Kickstarter is that when you're definitely helping us be able to support and fund the game, mm -hmm. um, but also you will be getting it earlier and you will be getting uh, stuff included into the game. Yep. There are no exclusives. There are no promos. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that Leader hasn't done ever. Yeah, if, you, if you're if you curious like how the Kickstarter might be stru uh, structured, mm -hmm. uh, take a look at like the Underworld Kickstarter. That's, yeah. This one has a similar structure to it. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, and then as far as kind of the time timeline of the logistics. I know a lot of people have been asking me is like, where are you at in design right now? What's the mm -hmm. expected development cycle for it? So this, uh, our development cycle will complete in April or May, mm -hmm. uh, probably probably closer to April. And that seems like a long way away, but the, uh, mostly that's just me padding. Uh, this design is further along than any game that I've ever taken to Kickstarter. Yeah. Uh, all, like by leaps and bounds. Uh, it's certainly farther along than Root was. It's about where Premiere 2 was or a little bit further along than it. So uh, a lot of the design time that we have left in our budget is for really aggressively doing balance testing, really seeing yep. the campaign in sort of strange and different places, doing a lot of usability studies, and then of course filling out like the game's massive art list. Yeah, absolutely. And I think an estimate too is we'll definitely be able to probably see the game early this time next year. Yes. Um, yeah. Yep. So. Yeah, I will, I, I, it is our hope that we can, we can have it in people's hands by this time next year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I think another good question is what kind of players do you think will enjoy the game? So you, uh, if you like interactive games, uh, and it isn't necessarily that you have to like conflict games to like this game. There are ways of playing this game pretty peacefully and you can still uh, find a lot to like, but you have to like interactive games. If you do not like games where you interact with the other players at the table, you should definitely not back this game. You will be very unhappy with it. Um, it is uh, more interactive than Root. It is of, of similar level to like a, a PAX level. There's just a lot of systems and basically every system in the game is hydraulic. You push one thing, another thing pops up. And if there's a player's head who's right next to the thing that's gonna pop up, they're, mm -hmm. gonna get, they're gonna get a little bruise. Very good. And then I think another one that kind of rides off of that is um, the game lending itself that so you had mentioned, like it's a game that remembers itself. The game mm -hmm. changes as you go from one to the next. Um, how long do you think that somebody could probably run a campaign and have options? It, I think if you wanted to just explore, if you wanted to see every card um, in an ideal world, which is like, it's not going to happen, yeah. but like in a perfect run to see every card, I think you need about 50 plays, um, which is a huge amount. I think yeah. most people, what, what we've found from testers who've run, uh, run the campaign quite a bit, sometimes around like the 15th to 20th or 25th play, they'll want to reset the box mm -hmm. just to see what a different branch might go down. Um, I am building the game with the intent that like you could easily sink a hundred games into it and yeah. still be surprising yourself because there are not only is there a giant card base you it's really the synergy of the different cards that creates the different dynamics mm -hmm. so in each game you'll have maybe 10 cards in play and then another 15 in circulation out of a card list of like about 200 unique cards. So which cards are in combination can lead to very, very different dynamics in the game. Yeah. Uh, somebody also asked, I think one of the discords, is it possible for a deck to completely run out of a given suit? And how can you get the suit back in the deck? That's a good question. Uh, so the way it works is during the reset phase, uh, which is called the chronicle phase in the game, um, you essentially place an order into the archive based on what happened in the game. So. You know, if you if you won because you you activated your your militant order knights, then the game is, says, okay, we're going to put six new cards from the order suit from the archive. We're going to be added into the game. If the archive can't fill that order, uh, what it does is it looks at the discard, which is the stack of cards called the dispossessed. Which, whenever you add six cards into the game, you remove six and they get added to the dispossessed, and you figure out whatever the, the weakest suit is in the deck, and that, that's recorded um, using this, uh, the suit supply system, which we don't need to go into. But basically, whatever suit is least present in the deck, 
some cards will be added from that suit, so they'll come back into circulation. Mm -hmm. And then all of the cards that have been getting kind of trashed yeah. uh, will get resorted back into their suits, so the archive will heal itself. Okay. So there is no end point, and what will happen is about every 8 to 12 games, you'll have that kind of like little soft recovery. Now that could lead to the really weak suit emerging and becoming very powerful, or it, it, could, it could kind of become a middling suit. You don't really know. It could go a lot of different ways. Yeah. And with that, that, that mechanic cycle in mind, how does that play into actual the storytelling that you're trying to tell with the game? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, um, what, what, what's happening in, in the story of the game is there are, there are uh, one of the funny things about this game is the way it treats outsiders yeah. and kind of influences that are not accounted in the game system. So if you think of a, another design that has a kind of rolling campaign style of something like Small World or History of the World. Mm -hmm. In those games, you're drafting what are essentially outsiders who are going to come storming through the gates and tear everything up. This game doesn't really do that. The problems are always kind of internal. And then when the suits come back, the idea is those are people from the outside of the game re-entering in some way. And then maybe the second time they'll find a home, or maybe they won't, and they'll get pushed out. Yeah. So it's up to the players. Very cool. Um, question that Matt from uh, Space Gas and Peace Turtles actually said, since the win condition for the game slightly changes between playthroughs, and the Chancellor is really the only unique power in the game, what kind of strategic decisions uh, does Cole see the community engaging in in lieu of faction guides? Oh, that's such a, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, so there, uh, one, one thing, whenever I'm designing a, uh, working on a project, I will always be thinking about um, what is the quality of a strategy guide that could be possibly created for the thing I'm working yeah. on? Yeah. And if I'm finding that I'm having a hard time thinking about what that guide looks like, yeah. then there's probably something wrong with the design, like at a very core level. Yeah. Um, so, what I think the, so I think that the, the core system is actually really, uh, there's a lot to talk about in terms of like, you could have a three, a three piece series on like principles of campaigning, yeah. like when to fight, how to fight, mistakes to make, yeah. and then understand how the different card powers might feed into that system. In the same way, like you, you could have a piece kind of about e each core element of the game, you can talk about that. Yeah. Um, and then you cer certainly in the way a faction guide might look, you could spotlight the Chancellor and talk about what they're dealing with. Because even though they're playing with almost the same set of rules as the Exiles, mm -hmm. the pressure of being the Chancellor, and I had a player kind of tell me this last night when they played the Chancellor for the first time, it is a very different feeling. Yeah. Because you start with a lot of power and very little momentum. So it's a little bit like the way the cats are in Root, and you just have to kind of shift how you're thinking about the game. And there, there's a lot to be said about starting with the Chancellor, not starting with the Chancellor. Yeah. Um, along the, those same lines, like each of the four victory conditions has its own own strategic paths kind of built into it. One thing that um, I have found is quite true about the game is that when players first learn the game, the first two turns, they tend to play very, very tactically. Mm -hmm. uh, the games have really high like battle attrition, a lot of armies are running into each other, they're very lossy. And then once people, after like, start, it usually starts in game two, sometimes it takes till game three, players start realizing how much they can plan. Yeah. So that like the game looks tactical, but executing a plan could take two or even three turns. The game is only eight turns on long max. Mm -hmm. So what will happen is, the way I tend to think about it is like in this game, you get one or two javelins that you're gonna throw. And you need to figure out when you're gonna throw them. And like, and the what, it, and like what, is sure. the, what is the right footing. And then you're having to deal with a lot of other concerns, but like it's really about those kind of crisis points. Yeah. Um, there, there isn't a lot, um, last thing I'll say is like, there isn't a lot of like arc. So that like in a, t in a game of TI for instance, you start small. You got to colonize planets. There's mm -hmm. like a kind of, the game kind of has like a three act structure. Yeah. This like starts you at the end of the second act. Like it gets you right into the heart of it. There's not really much of a build up. Yeah. I think a good example of just seeing the gameplay if people haven't seen it before is on our YouTube channel. We have the recording of our last live stream mm -hmm. right after Christmas, and there was there's those moments, those conflict moments. It was interesting to watch you guys go through because I know like Ryan had done like a very large one and how that affected the whole thing. Or there's several times that Marshall could have could have won and ended up winning. So, uh, you know, like I think basically in terms of strategy guides, you could do a lot of work on the different gameplay systems. And then you could also do work, like you, you can slice the deck in two ways. You can slice it by suit into the six suits. They all have their own different dynamic. And then 
Uh, if you didn't want to slice it by suit, you could slice it by card type. Yeah. Because they're kind of like five different things that cards can do generally, like action modifiers and different things. Yeah. And you could group those and talk about those in productive For ways. Sure. It'll be fun to see where the BGG's at. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> Um, another question is describing the shared tableau mechanism. We don't have the board out right now. Right. Um, I can build one. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, how does that mechanic work, and what influences what influences why you would play a card to a location instead mm -hmm. to your own tableau? That's a great question. So basically, the cards are lined up in a row. I'll kind of do this up here so you can see it, and then uh, cards that are played in the game will kind of exist on these different cards. So we'll do it like that's illegal. We don't want say it's like this. So when you have your pawn, you'll visit these different sites, and then you get to interact with cards on the shared tableau. Um, you would essentially get to interact with a card if you rule it, um, if it's in your cohort, or if you're just visiting it, if you have access to it. Um, so why would you play a card that you would have to share? Well, the biggest reason is you only have a cohort size of three, which is also your hand, mm -hmm. and it's really expensive to pay a card, play a card face up on your cohort. Uh, and it may have implications that you don't want to deal with. Um, your cohort also determines your popularity. Mm -hmm. So you could be faced with like, oh, this is a very powerful card, but it is from a suit that is not popular, so it will hurt my popularity, which has other ramifications, but I still want the power, so I could play it to a site I rule. Mm -hmm. That I still get the power, which is great, but now I'm not tacked on with the popularity. So that's one reason why you might play to a site. The other reason is that when you play to a site, the suit's very happy with you and they'll give you a, a favor, which is the currency of the game that you can then spend on other things. So like those are the two immediate considerations of like why you would bother to play, or the three immediate considerations yeah. of why you'd want to be playing on the board. Uh, scarcity of cohort, the fact that you get an extra buck if you play it on the site, and then also trying to deal with your popularity. Yeah. Um, kind of pulling to components again, somebody was asking, so Space Biff post his review preview last mm -hmm. night, and he was using metal coins. Is that going to be something that's in our game? He was using his own. Yeah, yes. he was using his coins. Yes. Yeah, um, I'm not sure what game they were from. So we, <laughs> uh, along the lines of our other Kickstarters, we're going to be bundling um, some freebies in for yeah. Kickstarter backers. These are things that will cost money. In some cases, they'll be even a little expensive um, after the campaign's over if you're just trying to find them in a game store. Yeah. But if you back them on the Kickstarter, you'll get them uh, kind of included in with your pledge. They don't cost anything extra. And uh, this is a funny game because normally we have kind of like a free expansion, but with Oath, everything is in the box. It like yeah. already includes just tons and tons of content. So the add-ons are cosmetic or like little gameplay yeah. improvers. And one of the things that we're going to be adding is uh, metal coins for the favor. These are going to be really nice. So they're not only going to be a little bit bigger than your usual metal coin, uh, they'll be thicker and they'll have a nice thick uh, ridge around them so yeah. they're very easy to stack. It's really important, like, a little bit like a poker chip, so it's very important in this game yeah. to like, look at a stack and be like, that is five chips. Yeah. Stacks never get higher than like six, yeah. but to be able to tell the difference between like three, four, five, and six, it means having a little bit of a, a thicker uh, poker chip and you know, we'll, we'll look at some other things that we can do to make them easy to, to tell yeah. apart. So you'll get really nice um, markers for the favor and then you'll also get nice tokens uh, for the Magic, the game's second uh, currency, mm -hmm. those will probably be done in resin. Uh, one of the things that I feel like I really took away from Premier is having a number of different materials in the box and having yeah. each of those materials kind of communicate a different thing about how the game works. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and kind of leading into, we mentioned that we we're going to have kind of those special components. Somebody had asked, um, what, are there going to be any secrets that we are revealing during the Kickstarter? I don't know. Do you want to answer that question? Um, there are there are definitely stuff that has not been, I think, fully revealed or yeah. have been fully talked about. Um, yeah, but I it also kept... like this isn't going to be the type of Kickstarter where we're going to hit you every day with something with great. like ah, oh, our card is a higher GSM now. Like yeah, this is linen fit. No, we're not going to do that. Yeah, um, there are some cool things that we have to show you, but. It's not going to be one of those where there's just like yeah. lots of secrets falling out and no. all sorts of stuff. I think the day that the Kickstarter launches, you will know everything. 
Yes. And then we will, throughout the campaign, is when we're going to take a step deeper, deeper to really dive in mm -hmm. uh, and really show you everything, like as like the components of the box, really what that looks like. Uh, I don't want to tell you guys, mm -hmm. but we'll we'll be able to kind of delve in deeper with that way. So I don't want to say secrets. I mean, there's secrets right now. <coughs> yeah. um, but this isn't a campaign built on secrets. No. No. We'll be very tran transparent. Mm -hmm. um, like the cover hasn't been revealed yet. That will be revealed. Mm -hmm. uh, everything like that. So you'll be able to see everything uh, and get all the information I think you would absolutely need to to be able to see if you want to purchase this. And then if you need more time to wait, we'll be digging more deeper and throughout as the campaign goes along. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of those being, so your designer diaries, where are those at during the campaign? So I've been writing over the past like three months uh, designer diaries on BGG. There are 11 now. Mm -hmm. uh, they're long. <laughs> you don't have to read them, but you might like them. Um, over the, so I'm going to be writing my last designer diary for now on Monday. And then I'll be doing shorter ones during the Kickstarter that will highlight the six suits yep. and talk about different design elements behind each of the suits, how they work, what the kind of space is that they hollow out. After the Kickstarter is over, I will resume the general de designer diaries on a much slower pace that will just kind of cover the game's development, how it grows and changes and all that. But it'll be yeah. a lot slower. Yeah. I like how uh, Patrick prefaced that secrets are that they haven't even seen all the cards yet. But other secrets, yeah. <laughs> other than the, the cards and everything <coughs> like that. Um, how long will the Kickstarter be? I, I'm confident to say that it's, it's going to be... 21 days. days. Yeah. It's going to be about three weeks. So yeah. It is three weeks. So It is three It's now three weeks. You can't change it. It's exactly that. Yep. We have said it live. Uh, no, it's also <laughs> been now what I've been planning around. Um, let's see. What is the perks? Um, prizes... Kind of going outside what has inspired you to design Oath, um, are there any lesser known works of fiction which include, influenced and supported your development of Oath? And I kind of want that one answered because your very first designer diary was about the books that you've read. Mm -hmm, uh, and they actually specify by music. <laughs> music that's influenced Oath? Yeah. Uh, you talk about your what you're listening to all the time. I do, but like, <laughs> see, Nick is over there. No. Let's see. Today I listened to. <laughs> Every Big Thief album while I was working. But none it. of it's influencing. I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I listen to a lot of music. Yeah. It matters. It influences yes. me in like a sideways way. Yeah. But it's not, I, I feel better about thinking about, because, okay, so when I'm reading, I actually shifted my reading list while working on this game because I wanted to kind of fill my head with the stuff that, yeah. you know, the game is about. I didn't really, my, my music listening is so bounded to the seasons that it, there, there's no way a game product I'm working on is going to, is, is going to, is going to rock it. I'm only chuckling because Kyle said the Conan the Barbarian soundtrack has influenced him. Yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at least we, at least we know. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, it's fine. So what, what I will say about music is like, I will shit at different phases in the project. Yeah. There's different stuff. So like this morning, very, you know, lots of editorial, a lot of like, Writing, yeah. So it was very in like a big thief capacity. It's a big, big listen this morning. A bunch of like quiet Mount Erie albums. There you go. You know, so that stuff. Um, I still a lot of Mount Erie working on this game. It's like yeah. about loss, you know. Yeah. Teddy, and then at later in the project, uh, things veer very hard towards hip hop when I have to get things done and quickly. Yeah, you have the pace. Yeah. I think it's more like in by the pace of like what you're doing right. yeah I've noticed like especially when writing it's all explosions in the sky mm -hmm. I can't have anything else outside of like I can't words it can't be it has to be like just well and Gates has a hobby of uh, not a hobby a habit of coming into my office and listening to very loud music oh. and so <laughs> she'll start talking and be like wait 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 Kanye is very loud right now and I need to turn it down <laughs> um what else was here um Ooh, you mentioned, oh, this is actually, you would like this. You mentioned on Twitter that a video game called Caves of uh, Cud. Cud was yes. an inspiration as a fan of video games. I'm curious, are there any video games particularly inspiring? Well, I could talk about Caves of Cud for an hour right now. Uh, <laughs> so, side note, we were playing last night, and the last playtest session got derailed by Caves of Cud chat, which I then carried through to mention and then talk about today during lunch. Yeah, well, I was going to say, like, Nick is so there's totally a, good man. <clears throat> so, I, I, um... My video game diet is really weird. It um, is mostly competitive games that I've been playing for a decade or more. Yeah. So like StarCraft II, Dota, Counter-Strike. 
plays with my siblings. Yeah. Every you know every night or every other night or so. These are like the ballast of my like, gaming habit. Like, yeah, I yeah, get yeah. to see some close friends. Yeah, see cool We're gonna play a game yeah. of Dota. We've been doing this for a decade. Uh, and then outside of that, I play a lot of like one to five hour indies. Yeah. Uh, but there's sort of no room in my diet for like any AAA titles. And it's not that I don't like them. It's just like they don't. I have no zone at which I can like play them through or play through them. Yeah. Um, for this game. I have been thinking a lot about uh, roguelike design because mm-hmm. one of the things that is so, when, I, when I think about replayability, uh, I mean essentially this is a the, the fact that every game blends into one another. Yeah. Um, there is it isn't exactly like a permadeath roguelike characteristic, but I think it's like a step away from it. And one of the things that makes those games work is they have a robust enough system. So yeah. Let me slightly start over. When roguelikes broke into the more of the mainstream, like the Splunky and games like that, uh, there was a lot of emphasis placed on like permadeath, procedural generation. Mm-hmm. Cool, those things are really important. But the the biggest thing I think, the thing that like still brings people to games like Adom, which is a fabulous roguelike, mm-hmm. uh, is that the the core system is complex enough and expressive enough that when you include some items and some mechanisms in it, it can be recombined in so many different ways. And so I was. I started playing uh, Caves of Cud recently and things like Dead Cells and, uh, and even Splunky and really paying attention to like what what are the elements that make this world feel so alive, that these tools feel so thematic and rich yeah. so that, that when you're talking about the games, somebody could overhear you and it would sound like you were telling a story, yeah. but actually you're just speaking in terms of the language of the game. Yeah. And so I've been really interested in that line between like storytelling about games and also just talking about Story games. Is, yeah. And so every single card in the game has I mean well here I'll give a I'll give an example. Yeah, There's we can show some, the cards. We'll show some cards. Uh, so the art is like filled with placeholders. We've got lots and lots of art, but like yeah. we have more cards than art right now. When you were talking about storytelling the story yeah, so, is right out there. Yeah, well we'll talk about it. I'll, I'll, I'll highlight a couple of cards. Uh, I don't know how this uh, is going to work. Yeah, I'm gonna let it there'll be a delay. Uh, so this is <laughs> the actually, acting troop. It's okay. You don't just know that it's a card in the game. <laughs> it's a card. It's a card in the game. There's a card in the game called Acting Troop, oh, yeah. which uh, it, it gets to behave as suits that it's not, which is like, well, that's a very obvious application of, yeah. of like what it's doing thematically, but then that has very interesting ramifications in the game because you can use that to fake your way into getting influence or magic, to like mm-hmm. sneak into a secret society. You could use that to shift the popularity numbers in a way that might be useful to you. Um, so, and then, like another card, for instance, uh, Storyteller. This is again, I don't know why I'm showing the art because this isn't the art of Storyteller, but just know that it's a card that exists, I promise. Um, so, Storyteller, the way it works is when you um, buy this thing, this privilege called the Darkest Secret, uh, you immediately increase its value. Mm-hmm. So, this is like thinking about what does a story do within the mechanisms of this world? Well, it's a way t- to insulate the mythology you're building around yourself, right? Yeah. Like, it's almost a little bit like propaganda. And again, this card can do a lot of different things. It can be a defensive card. It can be an offensive card. And trying to like work through the design of the cards in such a way as to give them many, many uses and many mm-hmm. ways of combining them, that's one of the reasons why it's a little hard to talk about replayability in the context of this game because every set of 15 or 20 cards that's in active rotation will have a really different feel based yeah. on the way the cards are combining. In the same way that like during a Dead Cells run, you had like these two grenades that behaved in a certain way mm-hmm. that changed the style of play you built around it. Yeah. Um, another question that's kind of coming up is, how is this different than every other legacy game? Which I kind of want to just- super different. Yeah. <laughs> I want to kind of briefly like mention, I we've tried to veer away from talking about legacy at least it's hard. It's like a term yeah. that we can't avoid because it's the best term for this thing. Yeah, with what is in our known realm of us right, like like, gamers, for sure. So, because what there, what I'm trying to tap into here is there is a strand of game design in the 1970s and early 80s mm-hmm. that essentially these were like campaign games. Yeah. But they didn't have a preset campaign. So no. the one that I think about a lot is this game called uh, Imperium, which was done by GDW. Mm-hmm. And one player played like the Rebel Alliance, another player played the Empire, very thin like Star Wars style play. Yeah. But depending on how the game turned out, it kind of like set the stage for the next game. So if the Empire beat the Rebellion into a pulp, 
the next game the rebellion is going to be a little more zealous and a little more active. The Empire yep. has a different set of problems. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty basic, but it did this amazing thing where the game, it allowed itself to tell really big stories. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about this because as a game player, I um, can't play long games anymore. I've got three children and um, I work too much. <laughs> and so I just don't have time to like sit down and play like yeah. a 10 hour game. Yeah. But I love 10 hour games. Uh, if I had my way, I'd like to be playing TI like every weekend. It's like, that's my jam. I want to play 1817 yeah. two, twice a week Yeah. Uh, for a year. That'd be great. Your board game diet. How yeah. you want it to be. Yeah, that's how I want it to be. <laughs> and uh, what bums me out a little bit about a lot of design is that in the rush to make like the simple sci-fi game or like the 90 minute like, you know, yeah. war game or something, you or uh, the 90 minute Civ game is really, you know, the chief culprit here. It, it uh, turns into a bit of a cartoon where it makes everything go very fast, like you're watching history on fast forward. Yeah. And so the core approach to this game is, what if instead of trying to put history on fast forward to get through the whole arc of human history in an hour, you instead say, no, we're gonna do the exact same pace, mm -hmm. but the game will fold itself up and set itself up very quickly. We think we can get people to set this game up in three minutes or less. And you can tell those big stories mm -hmm. just over multiple sessions. Yeah. And this isn't like a super clever trick, like D&D groups have been doing this since D&D's inception. Yeah. But it's a place I haven't really seen board games go, and then when legacy games kind of like burst onto the scene six or seven years ago, yeah. they were essentially like, they were doing a very, this is why I'm so hesitant to compare it to a legacy game. Yep. Because legacy games to me, are much more like storytelling games, and they're much more like the, a season of television, right? I don't think it's any surprise that pandemic. I mean, is pandemic like season, season one, one, right? Season two, this yeah. is not a season of television. This is a lot more like a free form campaign. Free campaign, yeah. Yeah, so it's you know w w with a persistent world, yeah. Um, and I, I, so it was just like it was a branch. I feel like once legacy designers saw the season model, mm -hmm. which was you know the model that started that. So you know, if I think about campaign games. There was a branch that started with like Risk Legacy, yep. and then everybody who wanted to work in that space started making like season model. Yep. And this is like a very this goes like back to the root of the tree, the the pre Rob Davio root. Yeah. Uh, and then says like, okay, what if we went back to those like '80s campaign games and we approach some of their questions with a little bit more of a modern design sensibility? Yeah. What might be at the other end of that road? And that's what this game. Yeah. Trying to do. And I think even when we were talking about um, like the marketing, how we're going to be talking about this game. We talked about that extensively, mm -hmm. I think, for a couple of weeks, is that, like, it, it, we are not going to use Legacy Game intentionally and everything like that just because of the space of where it already lives now. Right. And that this game doesn't quite live in that space. Yes. Um, I so, would not so want someone who, like, was like, I love Pandemic Legacy exactly, Season 2. Exactly, right. Like, this, you, it depends on why you liked that game, but it's very likely this is, like, not your type of game. Yeah, and also just to, like, say that to... Like, you don't rip up anything. You're not putting any yeah. cards. Nothing there will be nothing, anything. like, hidden under the insert. Sorry. Don't rip open the box. Yeah, please don't. Uh, <laughs> don't when you see it, it'll be very beautiful. Don't just start tearing it up. Um, <laughs> well, and, and part of that, too, is, like, I, you know, there is a, um, there is a trend towards um, games as the one-off experience. Like, you have to, if you don't win, and I, I see this, as a designer, I see this in, like, people giving design advice where you're like, you need to wow your audience in like 10 minutes. Yep. Or like, if you don't have them by the end of the first half of your first game, you've lost them. Yeah. And this game isn't like that. There's a learning curve. It will take you two or even three games. I think it's a little bit more like a ledge than root, where like, it, it takes two or three games to hop up onto the ledge. Yeah. And then there's a normal learning curve, but you do like, there's a bit of a wall. Yeah. Um, but you have, to, you have to give it time. There's a lot to exploit. This isn't a game that is built for you to play it once or even 10 times. Like this is a yeah. game built for you to play it a lot. Yeah. And if you are interested in going deep into a game, I think you will find a lot to explore in the game. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, that's great. You're being served by the mass, uh, you know, the, the majority of the market right now. So go play those games. Yeah. Uh, talk about the teach. You're, you've been mentioning, mm -hmm. mentioning it briefly here and there. So the teach for the, so the, this game is a real funny teach. I have done it during uh, Unplugged, I would routinely get through the overall pitch and teach in about 15 minutes. And if I was sitting at the table and we were gonna play for the first time, and people like, you know, like just play as fast as we can, mm -hmm. I can teach for about six minutes, yeah. and then we can just start playing. Yeah. And then by the end of the game, you know all the systems. On the other hand, 
if you want to do an exhaustive, like every single rule, very full teach, yeah. it's probably going to be like a 40 minute teach or even more, just because there's a lot like of little, sitting down with your yeah, and just like every little, every, you want to understand every little element, you can do that. Um, mm -hmm. What I will say about the teach is that the complexity of the game is basically like learning two root factions at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like if I had to teach someone from scratch, like the Erie and the Woodland Alliance. Yeah. And I picked those two because those are both like a little obtuse. They're not complicated, they're just obtuse. And this game isn't complicated, but it's a little strange. And so once you figure those out though, um, the thing that this game has that Root doesn't is in Root turns take a minute, yeah. maybe two minutes yeah. to work through everything. In this game, turns are very fast. Oh yeah. What we, what, once you know what's going on, your play time for this game will come down very sharply. We can routinely play a four player game of this in an hour or less. Yeah, which I mean, you guys did it, I think that whole stream was an hour and a half and that was about... And we were streaming, which is And bantering too, yeah. yeah. Which I think, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, you've mentioned The Office that, like even though a game session of this will be maybe 45 minutes to an hour, it. it it's the end of it, your game night session with it is determined by how, where you want to go in the campaign. Right. Yeah, so if you want, like, look, you, you made barbecue for your friends, you want to, like, really have a big game yeah. night, you can play this three times in a row and essentially play, like, Find a, something different. a three generational yeah. story, and it will give you the experience of playing, like, a really big, meaty game. Yeah. You could also just play this, you know, as a night ender or something over yeah. several weeks. There are different ways that you can approach it. And Dan Thoreau in his preview covered it really well. Mm -hmm. um, he covered around his generations and how the game progressed. Mm -hmm. um, question that people have been asking uh, is about kind of want to touch two-player and then you touch solo. Okay, cool. Well, I can, I can do them in the kind of the same breath. So uh, this game will feature an Atama design uh, that is, so it's, it's sort of like a bot, but uh, I, can, I can refer folks to Jeff Eggleston's excellent talk about the history of solo design, but mm -hmm. it is a um, sort of a virtual player who's playing by a slightly different set of rules who takes the role of the chancellor. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pretty fully featured bot. We're still in development, but players will be able to, uh, the, the bot will make offers of citizenship that if players yeah. accept, they will then have the classic infighting prestige battle, like court drama, that is sometimes featured in the game. Yeah. Or you can just try to beat it from the outside, in which case you have that experience in the game. Um, the bot will work either as a tete-a-tete -tete or as a uh, in a three-player context. So you can do either one, yeah. and uh, with, with very minimal scaling on the bot, and it'll work just fine. Uh, but essentially, is giving you the experience of something close to a three-player game. Yeah. Um, also, because we had mentioned at the very beginning of the stream, so it's one to six players, people were asking, what led you to the six player decision? Uh, well, there was a single piece that we needed to make it possible. One small so, piece. Yeah, so it was funny, you know, like I, um, I try to stay away lately from being too focused on what's the, what is the component ask of the game. When I was working on this game, I asked Patrick, like, hey, can I make a game that was like a little bigger than Root? A little more expensive than Root. Mm -hmm. uh, and when he said yes, I thought, okay, cool. So I'm gonna make a game and not really think about the components and just think about what, the, the, what game the game is wanted, de yeah. demanding. And at one point when I was talking to Nick, uh, it was clear that like because of some changes to the design, by adding a single piece, you could essentially have a sixth player. Mm -hmm. uh, and a single piece is not very expensive. It might be just a, a penny or a few pennies. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So like it just you know it's, it's just not that expensive from our side. So we had this option before us then of like, well, we could pull out a player and then lower the cost uh, and, and save some money, and then maybe we could even sell them later, or we could just give people the sixth player. Yeah. Um, we hadn't been testing the game excessively at six, but the it will work at six just fine, mm -hmm. and, and we will do some develop on it, development on it to, to make sure that, that, that that's the case. But even if you don't play with the sixth player, this was like, do you want just another color choice? And uh, when we sort of talked about it with the production folks and everybody in the studio, everyone was in favor of just giving people the sixth player, and it was nice to just uh, be able to give you guys all more and not really have to worry yeah. about it. And I did submit the BGG change today, so yes. <laughs> it will be changed. Um, Okay, so it looks like we have 10 minutes before we're going to wrap up. Uh, Nick, is there anything prominent on <coughs> Facebook? Um, and then also people have been asking. I think Ben been touching on this, but yeah. I, think, I think in general one of the larger ones has been like, if you were going to tell people, you know, like, 
one sentence, well, how is this not a legacy game? Because mm -hmm. still a lot of things sound like it. There's nothing pre-scripted. That's, yeah. This is, I think, like, you know, even more than the, like, no end point, even more than the, like, don't take tear up any cards, there is nothing pre-scripted. Yeah. I do not know what stories you're going to tell with this game. I did not write them. Yeah. Because that, that's a good point, too. Um, at least I've known whenever I describe to my friends, like, the legacy game, when I mention pre-scriptedness, they're like, hold on, it's pre-scripted? I was like, yeah, they're leading you to rip up to be a... And they're right. leading you to... And even in the more realize. robust legacy games where it's branching, Ching, yeah. like... The number of branches is like several orders of magnitude higher in this. Yeah. Just because it's up to the players. Yeah. Um, uh, but no, that's a good question. Here's a good one. Also, somebody asked, um, what is your your personal cold favorite part of the design that you unfortunately had to see go? <laughs> that's a great question. Oh, yeah. What, you, what girl? So much has gotten cut. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's your darlings. Uh, no, your no, darlings. No, no, no. Yeah, so... Um, you had to pick one. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pick one. one. I'll pick the, the easiest darling, the easiest one to cut. <laughs> We had this totally bananas combat system that oh. I loved. It had these little shields that you'd like flip up and you had to make these blind bids. I so the combat system, it doesn't, you may not know this even after you play the game, <laughs> but the combat system in this game is very in, heavily inspired by Dune's combat. Yeah. It just is, uh, it's a little meaner than Dune's and then it's also ex like exploded over several like turns and rounds and yeah. combats rather than in a single battle. Um, and when I was kind of trying to remix that space, I built this system with blind bids in it um, that was essentially a very full yep. mini game that you could play, that you could like... And go have fun with. Yeah, you yeah. could build it as a small box game. Mm -hmm. And I loved it and did not want to uh, get rid of it. And then, uh, unfortunately, I think I even maybe even went over some folks in the office who came to like it, despite that it was very goofy. It didn't get. It might have gotten even more goofy, and then there was a certain point where the rest of the design was was, was shaping up, yeah. and it was clear the product was just like over its complexity budget, and we had to cut something. Yeah. Uh, and actually, the biggest determinant there wasn't. Um, it wasn't actually even the complexity budget as much as it was the time. Mm -hmm. Like, it was very. One of the things I love about Roots Combat System is that you finish combat in a single roll. Yeah. And so I really wanted to avoid what I think it was like the StarCraft problem for people who've played the old Fancy Flight game StarCraft, or even Twilight Imperium for that matter. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the battles can get real long. Oh. And if you're not in them, they're kind of boring. Um, and I, so I was very important that the combat system was... So like, there's a very funny trade-off. I wrote about this in one of the design diaries about the combat. Um, you can either have something that is very complex and very short, or yeah. very simple and very long. Yeah, uh, which is a, it's a, almost a paradox, but it with this game, the whole argument of the game was you need to play it more than once. So yeah. okay, I would rather reward players who give the time to the design with a short combat system that's really robust, mm -hmm. than punish them uh, with a simple system that takes a long time to resolve. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything else, Nick? Um. <laughs> the, the rondell. Yes. Yeah, people are talking people about the rondell. Oh man, the rondell. The rondell's gonna be back. It's. I've already put it in a different project. Yeah. Um, um, people asking if there will be several pledge levels. I think you no. touched on that. Yeah, just one. One. one yeah. Level. I guess to kind of since we're wrapping up, rattle through like the the Kickstarter stuff that we do know. So we what do we know about the Kickstarter? The Kickstarter is on the fourteenth. Next Tuesday. If you want to be notified. You can click on any number of links that are pinned to any number of leader games Maybe related stuff. profiles. And Nick will drop in the link to, to the yeah. Kickstarter uh, preview page. And that actually has you, wherever you're logged in on Kickstarter, that will notify you. It'll, it'll, notify, it'll you. notify you. So it's, it's going to be on the 14th. Yeah. Uh, it will be a simple campaign. Yeah. It will have a single pledge level. We'll talk more about the design. Uh, I am going to be, I don't know if I've said that, I'm going to share the rules with everybody on launch day. Yes, yeah, I think we could say um, that. The rules will be shared launch day. Folks don't need to bother commenting with their millions of, like, typo concerns. Don't worry, we're not there yet. Yeah. But they're in a pretty, pretty good they're, they're in a pretty good spot. They're in a pretty good spot. I, yeah. I have no objection to sharing them. Um, uh, we'll also be launching, like, a gameplay video where we talk through some of the stuff. We've got lots of fun stuff that we'll be showing throughout the campaign. Anything, yeah. Did I miss anything? No, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, I know that people cover cover will be shown before <coughs> we launch. That's what I want to share about that. Yeah, the cover I can't will be wait. shown. We know what the cover looks like. Mm -hmm. If I say that's anyone's secret, that's the secret we'll keep. Yeah. So, 
There we go. Uh, time of launch, it will be, it'll be that morning. Um, We're in central time. So. We are, yeah, we are, are in central time. So if you're asleep in your country, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but we don't do early birds, yeah, so, so don't worry. For, it's open for 21 days. Yeah, yeah it's, it's open for 21 it's, it's days. It's like, yeah, there's no early birds. you are definitely be there to join us on day one for yeah. sure. And I should say, for those who, who haven't backed with your games Kickstarter before, our Kickstarters are real fun. They're just like parties. The comment yeah. section is really good. We, we're, I will be like living in that comment section day one. I'm sure Patrick, and Carol, and yeah. Gates will be there too. We love answering questions about stuff. We just we try to think. We think about our Kickstarters as an opportunity to like get to talk to you guys and yeah. really get everybody gets to know each other. And it's yeah, it's just kind of like a party we're throwing. So come to our party. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. Any other. Stuff, don't you? We already talked about the TTS. I think we're super good. If anybody has any like wrap up <coughs> questions that they want to ask about Oath or the Kickstarter, um, we already talked about solo play, mm -hmm. <laughs> legacy train games. Like we talked legacy train games. Leg legacy train games. I'm not working on any train games. Would you work on a train game? No, they're too close to my heart. <laughs> if you, yeah. I, I lack all it, It's like the, if you do the thing that you love, yeah. you know, like you can't, <laughs> I'm not saying that at all. No, I actually, I will, what, so one thing, um, this is a weird thing to drop, I mean, that's what I'm doing anyway. Sure. Um, I, I gave a talk about like designing at Leader Games and like what, what makes a project a good project for us. And like the number, one of the, like the top, thing after some reflection on the past couple of years was the design has to feel urgent. Like if we don't do the design, mm -hmm. it won't exist or happen. Yeah. So when we're getting pitches from people, if the design seems really good, like an, and so good that like another company might want it, I always tell the person like, oh yeah, you should just give it to that company. Yeah. Like because we're not we're really interested in like the odd ducklings. Um, mm -hmm. and really with you know the, the stuff I've done um, and, and worked on so far has been there been political games and strategy games, which is a place I feel like is both very well served and also very poorly served in the market. And mm -hmm. I, I think that I hope that Oath adds a lot to the, that conversation. Yeah. Train games? I got nothing to add. I think the folks who design train there. games doing great jobs. I got, I got no, a plus. Much respect. A plus. <laughs> it's the same. It's like party games. I don't want to design a party game because I think everyone's doing a good job. I'm just gonna keep playing the party games. Yeah. Um. I think maybe to wrap up. The, the whole conversation very broadly and Patrick can say to this also in the chat is what was the influence that you're hoping Oath to have in, in tabletop gaming it's heavy Ugh, that's a it's heavy scary question. question I know I think I want that, um, Oath if I just say it's about one thing it's about the end of the game and so I want people to think about the end of the game a little differently yeah so one I will say right now um, one thing about this game is if you're a person who is made uncomfortable by the thought of king making, you should definitely play Oath. Because it is gonna like yeah. it's immersion therapy. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna get right in there. And it uh, it was funny, it was like happening last night when we were playing where someone was like, Oh, I don't like can I even make that am I even allowed to make that choice? And I was like, just think about the possibility yeah. that this game is linked in a campaign does very things with very different things with how you think about the meta and fairness. Yep. And I have found personally, and with the folks I've played with, it actually opens up new ways of thinking about the end of the game mm -hmm. that I think then make the game itself a lot more interesting. interesting. Yeah. Um, and also, like, it doesn't, it doesn't feel as bad. Yeah. And so I, 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 if, if the game is one thing, I hope it kind of changes how we think a little bit about the way games can end. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, I think we're going to wrap up. Uh, thank you, everybody who watched, uh, we are going to be continuing these live streams for the whole duration of the campaign on Thursdays. Uh, I think next week is only going to be the Odd Duckling one being at 6 p.m., mm -hmm. but we're going to be playing on the TTS. Cole's going to be playing with the, the guys from S Space Cat? No? Yep, Space, Space Cat, Space Turtles. Turtles. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> uh, Ella Loves Board Games <laughs> and Meeple Lady. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're going to have some streams with Kyle Farron talking about the art, and then we'll have a whole office staff game at the very end of the campaign. Mm -hmm. That hopefully we're just going to do we're going to do a rolling game, right? Yeah, we're going to do a rolling game. It will be towards the end. You know, we won't be preparing for a Kickstarter anymore. Yeah, it'll be great. So we'll have the time. <laughs> 
But uh, definitely, I think we'll drop the link in if you guys want to be notified when we launch on the 14th. But other than that, um, we'll see That's you guys it. next Thursday. Thank you all. So, bye.